Felix here. The Saudis have given the Biden administration the middle finger, really, the oil middle finger, the barrel middle finger. And I turn to my um, commodity analyst, Tallulah. What do you make of it all? Serious repercussions? Apparently very serious repercussions. A couple of things worth looking at here. So oil prices have shot up 6% overnight, which is what? Inflationary? Good timing as the US is at its pretty much lowest level of oil inventory since, what, 1983, I think. Um, so why are they doing this? Well, apparently, the Biden administration irritated Riyadh last week when they said, we're not going to be buying any more oil to fill up that oil reserve that we've been depleting. Um, irritated the chaps, and they thought, well, there's one thing we can do. We could re cut production unexpectedly by a million barrels. Typically, when we do that, the oil price jumps anywhere up to 25%. Yeah, you heard that right. So far, we're up six percentage points. What's with my lighting today? It's a bit schizo, isn't it? It's a bit like all over the place. What's going on here? Hang on. Let's try that. Is that better? Maybe. I don't know. Still one side dark, one side... Never mind. Well, you'll, you'll manage seeing me half. Now, do you want to see some of the key data? Or um, are you just too busy with Easter week? By the way, Friday, we are getting jobs data. The market will be closed. Interesting, isn't it? So lots of data coming out while the market's closed and you're doing your, your Easter thing. What do you do on Easter? Well, there's one thing that we celebrate on Easter. It's financial freedom, which is why we're holding a masterclass on Easter Sunday. Indeed, felixfranz.org slash wealth. If you haven't claimed your seat yet, you're missing out. And I think at some point you have to ask yourself, how many crises do I have to go get through before I actually sit down and take this seriously. So now we've got an oil crisis on top of the inflation crisis, which is going to make inflation worse. And um, there are a couple of things you could do, a couple of trades you could do uh, that could protect you, that could potentially also make you money. We're going to get through that here. Uh, provided that you um, smash the like button first, we will continue rolling as we do. So here it is. Of course, none of the following is financial advice. You know that by now. I um, Take your financial advice. I give my views and, and opinions as a former banker, um, really with the idea that I genuinely want to help you get to freedom. I don't think you deserve a nine to five. I think you deserve financial freedom and time freedom, which is tremendous because I enjoy it and it's absolutely marvelous. Um, it allows you to wake up when you want to wake up, exercise when you want to wake up, which is typically what I do when I wake up, and then just, you know, Go and talk to some people and then help them along the way with their financial education. Uh, this is out from, I want to say, the FT. People familiar with Saudi Arabia said they were irritated because uh, the Biden White House refused to replenish the strategic oil reserve. And um, previously, they had told the Saudis, we'll be biased. And then they said, nope, nope, we're not buying anything. And they're Got a little irritated with that. And this is the extent to which uh, this White House is plundering the National Oil Reserve, which is fairly staggering, I must say. And I don't really know why, because I don't really think that we are in some sort of oil crisis previous to today. Um, look at that. We are at, what would you say that is, 1983? 1983? Maybe that's just the year Biden feels comfortable with. You know, he was like, in my youth, halfway through my life, 1983, life was good. And uh, I like, I'd like our everything in the world to be like it was 19, 1983. Some sort of Prince song springs to mind. So, yeah, fairly um, bizarre. Vote buying, I would call it. Bribery, I would call it, of the genuine populace there in the U.S., uh, this is the oil chart. We can look at the life as well, of course, but I took a screenshot like 10 minutes ago, so it hasn't moved all that much. And what can you see? Well, let me zoom in a bit for you here. Can you see that? That candle here and that gap from where we were Friday is huge. That's a huge gap. Up here is the 200-day moving average line, which sits at about $85. That's going to be some serious resistance. We take that out and we have an oil moonshot as a possibility, I'd say, $90, $95. Now, the big banks, the alleged smart money, 
I always say alleged, although they are pretty good at getting your money, aren't they? I mean, banks, generally speaking, manage to screw all investors uh, at every opportunity. Goldman Sachs is saying um, $95 is their new price target for oil. Would that be inflationary? Yes. What would that mean? Well, the Fed couldn't be cutting rates. They're going to have to keep rates higher for longer. What does that mean? It means tech stock tanks, tank, tech stocks tank. Uh, struggle with putting S's in the right place today. And energy companies have another golden summer ahead of them, potentially. Um, oil futures are at super low levels. So basically, everybody is short. Why is my pen so small today? Microsoft saving on digital ink, I think. Here we go. And um, CTAs. If you ever thought about buying an algo fund, I think this might put you off it, hopefully for life. This is the positioning of algo funds at the moment. They are short oil. So what do you think those funds are waking up to this morning as oil jumped 6%? A nice, strong kick in the groin, I think is probably what it feels like. And they've just been mistiming oil like really, really, really well. So maybe do the opposite of what CTAs do. They trade on some sort of algorithm, which is clearly fairly idiotic. So well, what does that also mean? Well, it sets us up for a short squeeze, doesn't it? Because what are these algo funds going to be doing this morning? Well, they're going to be unwinding those shorts as quickly as humanly possible to lose a little bit less money of the poor, poor suckers who put their money into these CTA funds. I don't really get CTA funds, to be honest with you. Um, they're just permanently chasing and they're permanently behind. So if you want to be permanently behind, CTAs, they'll usually also take a fair couple of percentage point of your fees. So you're really behind. But this is Goldman Sachs uh, this morning saying the lower OPEC plus production path in our pricing framework, which relates time spreads to OECD commercial inventory levels, it's just to make themselves look and sound smarter, implies a mechanical boost to December 2023 of prices of about $7 per barrel. Um, the French SPR release following strikes they were trying to give them more, more fuel so the French protesters could send more things on fire. I think that was the concern. And a modest additional downgrade to global oil demand, um, blah, 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 together, $2 down. So they're basically saying $95 is where oil is going to go. It's currently trading at about 80 But they didn't factor in on this, the smart Goldman Sachs people. They probably did write this at 6 in the morning and were probably still a bit hungover. Is two things. China reopening much stronger GDP numbers there than we were expecting. And secondly, airplanes. Remember what those things are? Those things that are in the sky occasionally? A lot more air travel. And what does a lot more air travel mean? More oil demand. So, you know, $95, here we come. And this is probably the most confusing chart of the day. I like to stimulate your gray matter. Uh, oil in purple. I mean, why always purple, Bloomberg? Why always purple? So this is oil. And then the, the other one is the 10-year break-evens. So what does it mean? Well, as oil goes up, the US 10-year goes up. Why? Because oil is inflationary. Oil price, higher oil prices cause higher inflation. So that's kind of where we are with that. And then, of course, the most important announcement of the day is uh, go to felixfans.org slash wealth and sign up for the masterclass. Why would you do that? Because I'll teach you how successful traders, not the CTA Muppets, the actual smart ones consistently beat the market. How do they do that? And how can you do that? And how can you also use it to protect your portfolio in days like this? Why am I doing this? I'm not quite sure. Uh, it felt dramatic. Uh, so couple of things you could do. This is from our newsletter, Trading Floor Whispers. If you're not signed up to that, you're missing out. You're missing out. There is a free newsletter. There's a premium newsletter. I recommend you sign up for the premium one, but they are both insightful. I hear some of you saying, I can't read that. Tradingfloorwhispers.com. Let me make that. There we go. Tradingfloorwhispers.com. Uh, written by one of our most experienced head coaches and investment banker of 20 years. Trades millions of dollars every week or day. Or, you know, here it is. That's the website. Go to the top right. When you go to the website, click on sign up. And then you can basically sign up. Well, I'm already signed up. So um, 
here is the the full article the weekly macro black gold issue as in the oil review see how quick we are with these things um you'll get those every monday and um i think there is a thursday one as well you know, a couple of during the week and a massive macro one as well and so on so this is the idea from that newsletter today and essentially what it's saying is that the dow jones is incredibly cheap compared to tech tech is more expensive than it was at the peak of the 2021 rally compared to say the s p or the dow jones index and what you could therefore do is, I'm not saying you should, this isn't financial advice, you know, be smart about it and so on. You could start nibbling on buying a bit of Dow Jones index via some sort of ETF of your choice. And you could start selling QQQ or any other ETF in equal amounts. And that's what a hedge fund would do. Hedge funds like, like to do these kind of trades where we are aiming to make money out of the difference. We're not aiming on, on the individual ones, we're just aiming to make money out of the difference. So we are basically saying the Dow Jones with all its oil giants is gonna go up more and the QQQ is gonna either go up less or even come down. That would be essentially the sort of trade that a hedge fund would set up. And when I was used to be a hedge fund strategist, this is exactly the sort of trade we would come up with. I didn't come up with this one, Elliot did, um, one of our team. And he's, he's, he's a very smart guy, but that doesn't mean this trade is, of course, you know, risk and all. Uh, you know that already, right? So uh, Mark says every single week something's coming up to try to tank the market. Indeed. And I think really the question is, are you prepared for it? Um, I hope so. If not, now would be the time to do something about it. One quarter of this year is gone. And like that, one half of it will be gone. And like that, you'll be dead. <laughs> Cheerful thoughts this morning. And then, but seriously, like I, I, if you didn't take action at the beginning of the year, I think this is really the last chance for this year. What's your return on risk, says, uh, says Thomas, compared to capital employed? My risk is the same as my capital employed as all my trades in the last year and a bit have been risk limited, risk defined, Thomas. So it's exactly the same. Um, let me see, guys, ask questions. Um, you're very welcome to do that. That's why we do these things live. Uh, the Italians are worried about the olive oil crisis. That would be serious. No, no, I went to a market yesterday. Um, I did a, lovely, did a lovely little hike. And lots of your fellow countrymen were there, Andrea, with their wares. And they had plenty of olive oil. So I I'm not too worried about that. Good morning from Nashville. Um, one place I'd love to visit. I haven't been yet. Vlad doesn't want to die. Um, I'm afraid there's very little you can do about that. It is, it is going to happen at some point. Um, very likely. I'd say probably even more likely than taxes. So oil this morning. I think if you think this through, one, it's a massively idiotic move by the US, draining the oil reserves, telling the Saudis who make most of the oil we're going to buy and then telling them, uh, whoops, that was a, that was a, we're not going to do that. But, you know, changed our minds, not going to do it. What are you going to do about it? And the Saudis are saying, well, we're going to cut oil production, million barrels less. And it's going to hit you in the teeth. It's going to hit you where it hurts because we know you Americans are worried about inflation. And you are hoping that you can cut interest rates later this year so that you become more popular and you might win this next election. Well, we can do something about that. We can deliver you some inflation. We we're really good at that in the 70s. And we're still very good at that. You think all your smart EVs mean you no longer need us? Not so much. Every bit of plastic made is made from oil. Okay. There is plant plastic. It's made from GMO corn. Not quite sure which is worse. But you know, you get the point. They are basically flexing their muscles and they're basically saying, you need us and you better play nice. At the same time, they are, you know, doing deals in RMB with China and so on. So if you don't see the writing on the wall, if you're in the US administration, I think you probably shouldn't be there. Boris, are you still buying weekly? Yeah, always, always. I, don't, I never stop it. Why? Because I think the ability of us to time the market is very unlikely very unlikely if you miss the two best days of the year is it the, was it the one best day of the year i can't remember i think it might even be the one best day of the year you basically never make any money so i think that's how it works i think it's the 10 best days of 10 years if you miss those 
you made zero. So generally speaking, I'm a fan of, of, of averaging in. Troy, what options trades would you set up? All companies or just futures? Um, I tend to personally trade oil companies. I understand them a little bit better, the big ones, rather than the oil futures, because the futures markets is a bizarre one for commodities. Um, so yeah, you could do something bullish, um, or as I said, you know, what I was suggesting there with with maybe a um, not saying you should do that, obviously, but you know, go long Dow Jones and and, and short tech. Um, you could also simply start buying some cheap puts maybe on the QQQ. Um, they're still pretty cheap. And generally, this is the this is why it's so important to understand how markets work, right? So a put option is simply a protection. Think of it as a protection. So when the market falls, the put option makes you money. So when the market has rallied a lot, those put options are very cheap because everyone's forgotten that things can come down. Now what goes up must come down. So when things have rallied a lot, that's the moment you want to be buying those put options. And they're super cheap. 50 bucks or something will protect like a $30,000 portfolio, something like that. And so I don't understand why people don't do that, to be honest with you, if you are um, you know, heavily in tech. Troy, uh, there is something about the quality of the U.S. reserve. Okay, I, I'm not a chemist. I don't know um, the difference between, uh, honestly, light oil, crude, or any of it. Uh, so I just tend to look at crude. That's what most people look at. Uh, but yeah, obviously, there are a gazillion quality variations within oil, depending on where it's coming from. Um, Munin, he says, I'm finally joined the Options Masterclass. I'm happy to finish the theory part and start making some money. Very excited for you. Very glad you're in there. I'd always say to you, paper trade much longer than you want to because it's free and the experience you learn is free. So don't like, you know, uh, run into it. Are they just cutting production in regards to the US, um, Sam? No, it's, it's, it's global. So OPEC plus is basically all the oil majors and they're just saying we're cutting a million barrels of production. Now, they tend to not be that honest with one another because that's the problem with oligopolies. If you study economics like I did, uh, there is, you can study the theory of, of you know, what, what, how does an oligopoly kind of work? How does it work when you have a cartel? Well, in a cartel, everybody says, okay, I'm going to cut, you're going to cut, everybody's going to cut, right? But there is, of course, an incentive for everybody or for at least one person to say, well, I'm going to tell you I'm going to cut, but I'm not actually going to cut as much. And that way, I get to sell more oil at the now higher prices. And so in reality, they all do that. So a million barrel cut isn't actually going to deliver a million barrel cut because, you know, um, the oil shakes are, are, are not that honest, apparently. Mega says, do you use an app to trade? You mean like a like a brokerage? So we've done, we've actually uh, in the midst of building this uh, thing called Options Watch, um, which I'm super excited about. And um, this is this is live. So you can go to optionswatch.io and you can look, say, for stocks with high IV. Uh, you could say exclude if you understand what IV is all about as an implied volatility, which is really important for options traders, you could say, well, let me exclude the top of the stuff at the ready at the top. So I just want maybe like 65 to 90 because everything above 90 is banks and I don't want to touch that stuff. And then you get, you know, every, everything else, 3M, Big Bear, Intel, XP, Merck, you know, there's a fair few that one could in theory trade, Verizon, Snap, you know, Prudential, that sort of thing. Um, and then you can also see when their earnings dates are, the dividend dates are, and all that kind of stuff, their betters and stand deviations. And you, you can click on them. So say if you want to trademark, you click on it. And um, then here you have the stock chart. And then here on the right, which I'm covering, I appreciate that, um, you have um, the the profit and loss, you know, set up for your, your trade, whatever your trade is. Um, you, you, you know, you have that sort of thing there. So th that, that's one thing I definitely use. Uh, and, and otherwise, I use a brokerage. Uh, I use Think or Swim, in fact. Okay, uh, Charles, yep, 
Buffett bought a boatload of Oxy last year, and that's made him a lot of money, and this will probably make him a lot more money now. It's an assignment risk with a butterfly, Stevie. If you are short an option, there is an assignment risk. I think that's just really the, the, the short answer to it. And, and Abba, you're quite right. Um, bizarrely, much of the world's fertilizer production comes from oil. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Synthetic fertilizer. Mm, can I have some of that with my, my breakfast, please? But yes, of course, it's true. So it pushes up oil uh, food production costs as well. Can you trade options based on dealers, gamma, and delta exposures? I'm seeing zero there. Yeah, I'm actually thinking of, I think I might do a, either a little series or maybe we'll do a masterclass um, maybe in May on um, on zero day options. I think it's a it's it's here to stay. So I think it's worth understanding, Saviad. Brandon? Who's Brandon? Is that Biden, is it? I don't know, you can confuse me, guys. So if you've just tuned in, futures for tech are down 0.8 percentage points here pre-market. The Dow Jones index is up 0.4%. Why? All the oil majors lurk in there. Uh, oil trading 6% up at above $80. Um, Brent crude oil is at, at almost at 85, also up 5%. Volatility is spiking up again. And the dollar falling a little bit here this morning. If we look at the pre-market, let me see what the big movers are. Um, Macy's up 5%. Interesting. Um, Polster up 2%. X-Bang up 2%. Verizon up 0.6%. Uh, banks are recovering a little bit. Tesla down 3% at $200. They actually, I thought they had pretty good delivery numbers, I must say. But, you know, Tesla is a... Doesn't react well to good news, I find. Uh, so yeah, we are broadly seeing essentially oil up, tech down. I think that's the way to describe it. Has the SEC always been against retail investors? Is it just against La Biden, Stephen? I would say that the system, if you might want to call it that, or the administration of whoever happens to be in power is fairly similar. I think it doesn't really depend much on the administration. Essentially, well, my honest honest truth is that it's just Wall Street lobbying money that runs that, right? Um, they want regulation. They want legislation because the more regulation there is, the harder it is for people to enter the space. I mean, try getting a banking license today, right? It's virtually impossible. So it's all there to keep people out. I mean, these bank runs, who do they benefit? JP Morgan, Bank of America, the big boys. Um, and the small ones disappear. And I think that's always been the case. I think regulation has always been there to protect those with most money, the largest corporates, the largest organizations. And you can run and rave against that and just be like, well, it's really unfair. And it is. The world is not a fair place. But you can still make money and you can still live a great life. And I choose to understand how it works and live a great life and enjoy myself rather than, you know, protest. Um, I don't think it really gets us anywhere. So I think my protest is basically to teach people how it works and to teach people how they can learn to build extra income streams. And then they have that choice, the optionality to quit that dreaded nine to five or, you know, do whatever it is that they want to be doing with their, with their time. And actually, when they do want to retire, do so with sufficient money and, and not with, you know, what most people do, which is like ridiculously low. Um, You're saying, what was the best investment in your life long term? Do you ever buy something and sell it for like a 5,000% gain? Um, I've certainly set up some options trades that really blew out. Yeah, uh, that, that happens. Not frequently because I don't look for those things frequently. I'm more of a, I like to make a steady 
kind of a consistent return. And I, I mean, I'm still, I, I aim for like 10% a month. So it's not like my, my, my aims are particularly low uh, and we could discuss whether that's a realistic number or not, but it certainly has been last year um, and the last couple of years before that. Uh, but I started tracking it particularly well last year because you guys keep asking me about it. And before that, it was just me. Um, but I'm not the, let's find the 10X stock guy because most of the time that happens. But then you also bought 90 other stocks that didn't go anywhere. So your average is not going to be the 500,000%. 5, it's just you're going to tell all your buddies at the next party that that's why you, what you bought and you're going to forget about the other 90. So I, I would always be a little cautious with that. So I, I personally buy what I would consider to be high quality stocks, like high gross margins, high return on capital employed, long-term earnings growth, super positive and all that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, if you need inspiration to hold, honestly, um, like in our Patreon, we've got a lovely spreadsheet, which basically shows you all that kind of core data. And, and if you look at something that's got a you know, high return on capital employed and good long-term earnings growth, relatively low debt and good margins, you kind of just see that compounding happening like again and again and again and again, which is why holding on to things in the long run um, is, is often a good idea, unless the business sucks, in which case you, know, you want to get out of it as quickly as possible. Seabiscuit, super happy for you. Started buying all a few weeks ago. Um, you know, we did some options trades a few weeks ago right? on bullish that were oil, on oil, but they're kind of bit us in, in the backside because uh, oil came down and now it's, it's it's spiking up again. So your move was smarter. Samson's a great way to protest. Yes, it's a little bit more uh, civil than uh, I'm in the south of France here. I'm in Monaco, and apparently in France they are. You know, things are on fire, they're rioting and so on. I say apparently because I don't have a television and I don't really watch that kind of news, but people tell me that. So I, I prefer to um, sit on the beach and tell people about investing. Uh, I, I think it's much nicer. Here we go. Okay, guys, if you have any questions, uh, chuck them out here. That's where we do these lives. So let me just give you a roundup. NASDAQ is down 0.8%. The oil is up at eight, just over $80. That's the light crude oil futures. Um, let's have a look at the QQQ pre-market down 0.6%, basically on the oil hammer. The Saudis have given us a bit of a kicker or rather given the administration a bit of a kicker in the US. So this is the, uh, <laughs> this is the announcement of, uh, of the Saudis. And it's like, hmm, you know, and now we have a little bit of nibbling going on here, but not, not a lot. And if you look at the S&P, down just a touch. But the problem is that tech is more expensive compared to the S&P than it was at the top of the 2021 market. So... This tech rally, I, I don't know. I find it hard to stomach, I must say. Mega says, will the US do a deal with OPEC to get them to put production back up? Well, they'd have to say we're going to buy some. Um, say we buy a million barrels and you don't do the cut. Is that a good deal? I don't know. You can't really negotiate with OPEC. I mean, OPEC basically does what OPEC wants and and they are happy. I think their sweet spot is about $90 oil because over 100, the US shale oil drilling becomes profitable. And, and then that becomes a bigger thing, right? So it means the US becomes more self-sufficient. Below 100, it's not really a great business. So people don't want to invest in it. So they're kind of quite happy to yo-yo around that 80 to 90, $95 mark. Maybe occasionally go to 100, you know, get a bit of a, an Easter bonus and then they bring it down again to 80. And that way they essentially keep the competition out of business. I think that's sort of the strategy here. Natural gas, Ryan. Well, I think the trade was, this is really the Ukraine trade, the, the Europe trade. Uh, we all thought that Europe was potentially going to run out of gas. And it was an incredibly mild winter, so it didn't. And therefore, the storage capacities are pretty full. Could happen again next winter because the infrastructure build out takes like three years. So that's not going to be available next year. So you're essentially making a trade on weather. I think that's that's a fair assessment there. So 
I yeah, I, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not in that, to be honest with you. But obviously you have to think about what you hope to time horizon there. Uh, Tom, every three days I go some euphoria to disaster stories. Absolutely shows no one understands what's going on. Exhausting. Well, the thing though is, Tom, and that's a lovely little dog you've got there, if that's yours. Um, a lot of people are making money out of these moves, right? There is always a silver lining. There's always an opportunity out of every disaster or bit of euphoria. And that's really what I want you guys to understand. So that's why we we're looking at, you know, what we do in our, our newsletter, for example, here, like this kind of a trade. And I'm not saying you should do that, but if you look at the Dow Jones index over the tech index, the QQQ, the NASDAQ, it's at very, very, very low levels. It's, it's slightly above 2000 valuations, which just means that tech is incredibly pricey. So there is a trade right there, right? One could buy Dow Jones index, one could sell the QQQ. I'm not saying you should do that. There's obviously risk with that. It could go the other way and, and you know, you could lose all your money and, and everything else. But um, People are making money out of this. And the more you understand the market, the more you are confident with what you can do and how you could set up that trade and how you could limit your risk, for example. Like you could hedge the, your positions at the same time. And that way you could go into it with a very defined risk. And you'd say, I could lose a maximum of $100 or something like that. If you understand how to do that, you look at these things not like, oh my God, it's all over. Uh, but you think like, hmm, how can I make money out of this one? And that's what I'd love you guys to, to start to understand. Because... They want you to have the reaction, the very natural reaction here that, that Tom has, which basically says it's exhausting. The, in my view, media wants to cause fear and flip-flop on issues so often that you give up and you just say, you know what, this money stuff, I'm going to leave that to the professionals, some monkey-brained fund manager Who's going to take my money and charge me 2 3% a year and, and, and let them do it? Because I don't understand that. It's just so confusing. It's up, down, and up and down, and up and down, and up and down. I'm exhausted. And that's what 90% of people do. Now, 90% of fund managers underperform the market. 99% of retail investors, that's you and me, underperform the market. So do they win or do they win? Of course they win because they get to keep fees. No one takes their money out of these funds. No one changes banks because their bank manager or whoever manages their money lost some money or failed to beat the market yet again. No one does. You know why? Because no one knows where else to go. No one's like, oh, well, I know. There's this brilliant guy down the road. I'm going to go there. No, nobody knows. Everybody you ask says like, oh, yeah, mine sucks. Your sucks. My bank sucks. We all hate them. And uh, I'm just going to be resigned to it. I'm going to keep working till I drop dead. But that doesn't have to be that way. You can educate yourself or you can you know, join a community like ours and take courses, coaching, mentoring, consume all the free stuff we put out, join our master classes like this one here, Felix Frenzadog slash wealth, and just immerse yourself in this because we shouldn't be employees. We shouldn't be business owners. We shouldn't be entrepreneurs. We should be first and foremost money managers. Because why are you doing all of that? Okay, you might have some satisfying vision, mission, um, why you're doing what you're doing. But let's face it, 99% of people go to work to make money, right? Because that's they have to pay rent. They have to pay for the mortgage. They need to save money for the college funds of their kids or whatever it might be that, that you have to pay for. So if you're in that position, why don't you want to understand to how to manage your money? Your money should make you more money than your job. That's got to be the goal. That's got to be the vision. And once you've set that goal, you just got to figure out a way to get there. And, you know, we can definitely lend a hand with that. So if you want to lend a hand with that, well, you can give us a call. We can talk you through what we do. You can just join our masterclass, for example, up here, Felix Spencer, Rock slash wealth, and, and just start to absorb and learn. And I think if you do that, you will then look at these things and go, okay, oil is, is, is rallying. Okay, what does that mean? Well, we're going to get inflation. Tech stocks are going to get hit hardest because interest rates are going to stay higher. The Fed is going to keep them higher. And I know that although those tech companies, valuation is based on discounted cash flow models, which take inflation into account to a very serious extent. I know that bond yields are going to go up most likely. And the Dow Jones index is probably going to go up because that's where all the oil majors sit. Do so you know that suddenly they're like, 
bing, 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 five, six opportunities you could do in terms of investing, trading, hedging, protecting yourself. And it becomes a completely different landscape to just, there's a scary headline and let's go and, you know, drink a bottle of beer or something. So um, let me just see any other questions here. Matthew, you bought some QQQ puts on Friday. Well, that might probably pay off. Depends on the time frame of those, but that might might, might well pay off. Ricardo says McDonald's is laying people off. Mm, that's not good news, is it? If McDonald's are laying people off, generally recession is coming fairly soon. Um, start managing money by going debt-free. Absolutely. Debt-freeness is also a whole thing. We're going to do some content also around how you get debt, become debt-free in the coming weeks inside the community. Sabiat says, institutional traders have one advantage over retail. They have colleagues, advisors, risk managers who oppose their biases, hence they're less biased than retail investors. Yeah, and, and I agree with you on that. And I think that's why you want, you want a community, you might want mentors who can give you that sounding board. Um, I mean, I do it, right? So in our community, we have a bunch of investment bankers, uh, guys who went floor traders, market makers, and so on. And I have the luxury of, I can call these guys and go, what do you think on this? And they'll tell me. Now you have the same luxury. All you'd have to do is you join our community, right? And you, you join our coaching program, you could do the same thing. And you could say like, this is what I'm thinking about. What do you think about that? And now they're not going to give you financial advice, but they're, they're going to take apart your strategy. And, and that's always helpful. That's how you become better. Uh, Bob, how many hours per week do you spend researching company information for options trading? So I'm a fairly lazy trader. I do about three hours a week because I run businesses and I also really enjoy running this community and everything else. Um, when you get started, ideally, you spend a little bit more time, but it doesn't have to be that way. You, you, you can do this really on a time shoestring budget uh, because... We don't need to be watching charts all day. We don't need to be doing all of that. And in terms of understanding businesses, I think it's a great thing to do to maybe pick a business a week or every other week um, and, and, and start to learn it about it and start to understand it and start to do some simulated trades on that. And then you sort of build out your knowledge around certain industries bit by bit. You don't have to do it all in one go. You don't have to understand everything in one go. You just have to make a start. And I think people come up with objections for why they want to be able to delay this because it looks like and sounds like work, and it is. And therefore, they're always like, yeah, I'll have more time in September. I'll do it then. I'll have more time in after this and after that and after this holiday and but busy at work right now. And before you know it, it's 2069 and you're dead. Um, and that's literally what happens to people, right? They just drift through life without ever taking it the ball by the horn, so to speak. Boris has noticed that he makes better decisions after he hits like button. Now, that's the kind of knowledge that we want to be putting out there here. Uh, 220 of you have not found the, the like button. Boris, real advice. Smash it. Gold threading with 2K. Well, if you an interesting one is if you look at the gold chart and the oil chart. Let me just pull that up for you here. Um, so if you look at gold, and not on a minute, but on the day, and um, let's pull up oil, uh, crude oil futures, crude CL, crude oil, Mexico, and oh, that'll do. Yeah, that'll do. Um, and let me just hide a few of these. This is gold. This is oil. See the gap? You see what typically they trade somewhat in line? Not always, but there is some correlation here. So are we going to gap up? If we do gap up, then, you know, we're going to get to like $110 or something. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But, you know, there is a massive gap here between the two that isn't usually there. So it's definitely an interesting, interesting pair there that you th throw out. Why would natural gas prices fall as all goes up? I think it's about demand. I think uh, the demand isn't there, whereas oil demand is, is, is there.
10x trading says to put it in perspective does opec see a recession right around the corner and starts cutting well they don't really care i think i think that's essentially the message they're like we're going to do what we're going to do and you don't want to buy oil well we're going to make it more expensive for you simple as that uh, so they are not some sort of elected government who feels like they need to bail out the world like remember the 70s i mean you might not remember the 70s i wasn't alive in the 70s but i studied it extensively because it was one of the big things in economics at the time uh, the oil crisis oil shocks of the 70s essentially caused massive inflation and massive recessions and saudis didn't give a shit sorry excuse my language and i don't think they do now so the us isn't playing nice with the saudis and therefore the saudis aren't playing nice with the us i think it's as simple as that if you knew the general direction for the next business quarter would you do longer term or still stick to short term options trades you see i always do both um i'm not somebody who thinks there's only one strategy and you must do this one thing otherwise you know everything ends and some people say uh 100% real estate, nothing is as good as, I think real estate's amazing, but I think there is also a place for everything else. So what I do is I trade for the short term because I don't know direction and I buy every week for the long term. And that's just pretty much a pre-set list of stocks I buy every week. And then I also buy property and private equity and you know all sorts of other things, anything that comes up that, that looks good and that sort of hits certain, certain numbers. Um, I don't think one has to be exclusive. I think it's actually a good thing not to be. You had car-free Sundays in in the in the seventies. Lovely, just so, to save um, fuel, right? Mm, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't think that's ca coming anytime soon. So, do you think bricks has something to do with the oil cuts? No, I don't think so. I think it's kind of like the Saudis are irritated with the US saying we are going to buy oil and then saying, oops, uh, we're not. It was an April Fool's. And I think they're just like showing who's boss, essentially. And they can do that. They have that power, right? So there we are. Now, if you haven't already signed up to Felix Rensselaer's Wealth, our masterclass this very Sunday, you are going to miss out on a real treat. I will show you how successful traders consistently beat the market. And there's two things to that. One is making money. And two, even more importantly, not losing money. If you don't lose money, you're already beaten most people. And then we look at how do you actually make money in, in, in those situations. And um, I just think it's the same. We are one quarter through the year. One quarter of 2023 is already gone in the, in the rear mirror. Uh, so it's time to... Uh, do what might feel a little uncomfortable and, and learn and embrace something and become a great money manager. And that's essentially our, our mission is to just help everybody to get to financial freedom. Like when I started as an investor, I sucked and I lost money, got screwed. The bank made money, I lost money. And it was very frustrating and I didn't know what to do about it. And then thankfully I became an investment banker and then I suddenly realized what everybody was doing and, and, and learned from traders who have tons of tons of experience, decades, how they do it. And I learned that I adjusted that and I essentially built out a method. And now I have time. And my whole mission is just to share it with you. Why? Because it's super gratifying. It's just super gratifying. When you teach people and you see how their life changes and you see the how they look at money differently and how they're making their plans and how they're succeeding with their plans, then, um, yeah, it's very satisfying. So I, I really enjoy it. Um, come and join me on that on, on Sunday. Um, also, feel free to give us a ring down below, felixfrenzelog slash coaching. If you have any questions on how we work, what we do, then we are an open book. That's always going to be the thing here. So I want to say thank you for watching, for tuning in. I will hope to see you tomorrow, perhaps later today, I might have put out a video if something dramatic happens. And um, uh, keep, keep learning, keep studying, and see you tomorrow.